very much. I'm Scott Miller. I'm current president of Teca. <coughs> Uh, I just wanted to talk about, uh, it's a few times I've talked about it now, but uh, once again, uh, CSA F280-12, <coughs> the building code states, thou shalt use CSA F280-12 methodology for doing heat losses in the province of British Columbia. Um, <coughs> that's been the case uh, since the last building code edition came out, and uh, we are now uh, becoming compliant in that. So. If you are in this industry, you do heat losses, thou shalt use that format. So <clears throat> we've developed our software uh, around the CSA F280 um, platform. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever used our quality first software for heat losses uh, in the past. It's, it's been around for many years. Uh, so that's no longer a viable format. Um, when you do heat losses, submit them to municipalities or however you're doing your heat losses, it should be done in the F280-12 format. So now we have the course, we can teach it. If you need to uh, uh, get used to it, uh, we can teach you a one day course of CSA F280-12. You can buy our software in about a week's time. Uh, we now finally have our cost for our software that we've developed. Our software um, uh, has a format where you do the CSA F280 heat loss calculation, come up with your result in the end, uh, after that, you can either uh, do a, uh, go right into a hydronic heat loss or use the CFM BTU per room calculation from the software and put it into our old quality first duct design software or however you want to do your duct design. If you do your own, um, that's up to you. Uh, anyways, that's for sale. There's a couple of different programs on the market. Ours will by as usual be uh, the least expensive. I was gonna say cheapest, but that's not the appropriate term. So about a week from now, you could just go on to our website and actually download the software and start doing your uh, heat loss calculations uh, as per the BC building code. How much? How much? 495. <laughs> one Anybody? Anybody? I heard one cough out there. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> <laughs> so in, in comparison, uh, the only other uh, uh, ones that are made that are from the states, actually, uh, there's two that are uh, that are code compliant, if you will. They start at uh, around 600 Canadian, and every year, of course, you have to uh, pay another couple of hundred dollars, an ongoing thing. So uh, as usual, our, our products, you know, we're a nonprofit society, so the idea is not to make a lot of money off of this. It's just really to cover our cost to create it and provide it because that's what we do here is we educate. We want you guys to do a better job. So we've developed that, and I don't think you'll find less expensive. Um, you don't have to take the CSA F280 course with it. If you're already very comfortable with heat loss software, you could just download the software itself. If you feel like, you know what, it's a whole different methodology, maybe I should take the course, get used to how it works, then just take the course. And then the software would be included in the course. Don't ask me how much the course is. Um, <clears throat> so in one week, you'll be able to do all of that. Uh, heat recovery ventilators, been around forever. Uh, there's never been a course in that, a proper course. Uh, City of Vancouver will now be demanding uh, that you have certification and installation of HRVs. We've created a course around that because of the demand. Um, it's only city, uh, so far, the city of Vancouver, that will be asking for a certified installer stamp to do that. So we've created a course. We've tried to keep it to one day. Uh, we'll be offering that in January as well. Um, I don't know that any other municipalities yet are asking for that for the installation of HRVs. If you take the HRV course, the reason we can keep it to one day is you've already taken our ventilation guidelines course. Of course, ventilation guidelines is all about choosing what method you're gonna to use to ventilate the house. There's the building code requirement for air changes. How are you gonna do it? Is it gonna be form one, form two, form three, or form four? Form two is HRVs. Okay, so you've already under, you already understand through the ventilation guidelines course, which is a one day course, um, how to ventilate the house, what the, what the um, uh, building code requirement is, now to install an HRV is a different thing, it's a different animal. It's not just a bath fan on a timer, you have to size the ductwork. So the idea is select the appliance. If you want an HRV, which one is it? How many CFM, how should I do it? What's the difference between an HRV and an ERV, for example? How do they work? What's the best principles? How do we size that ductwork? Where do we run the ductwork to? How many rooms need it? 
So we go through the duct layout, of course, sizing the duct properly, and then commissioning. Heaven forbid we should put this thing in, go through all that trouble, and then just turn it on and hope it works. Let's go through the balancing process. It's not that complicated, but you should really do it. In fact, you have to do it. That'll be part of the checklist, which the cities will be looking for. The, the checklist will be on our website, so the cities can even look for what the checklist is. Did you commission this thing? Uh, we all know that a lot of them that have been put in, there's been studies done that it's just not done right. Now, it's, it's not, I mean, of all the things in, in the heating industry, you've got hydronics and forced air design, the heat pumps and everything else, an HRV should, in my mind, be the one we should be able to do quite well. Fill out a checklist at the end, put the sticker on, great, it's done, stamp, everybody's happy. So that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, course is ready for uh, attendance in January. Scott, I just wanted to say that the, um, the, the prerequisite for the HRV course is our quality first ventilation course. And if you don't have it and you want to take the HRV course, we've got a few spots left in our class this weekend in Burnaby. Oh, okay. So there's over, there's what, 1,020 people? 1,055 people in the last how many years that have taken the guidelines course? Three years of over a thousand people. So I'm just surprised if you actually don't already have the guidelines course. But if you don't, go ahead and take it before you take the HRV. If indeed you are in the business of installing HRVs, should take the course. Make sure you got the guidelines first. Okay, moving right along. So Einer introduced himself, kind of, completely undersold himself as far as I can see. Uh, 16 years of education and experience in the residential construction industry. Um, Einer's a civil engineer. Uh, he's evaluated over 2,000 homes uh, for different issues, problems all over the lower road mainland, hundreds of newer homes. So uh, talk about HRVs, uh, air changes, um, air tightness. Uh, he's also an energy advisor. In fact, he teaches a course. I've known Einer for many years. We got the top guy in the whole entire industry, luckily, right here, right now. This goofy step code stuff, oh, pull your hair out with it. Uh, a lot of municipalities are asking for step one, step two, lots of them, step three. What does that mean? I don't know. That's why we have guys like Einer here to come out and spell it out for you on a mechanical level. What does that mean to us? Having said that, Einer. All right, good evening, everyone. Should I talk into the mic? Ask Bendix what's best for his filming of you. Doesn't matter, what's best for the filming. Okay, as long as it sounds okay to you guys, we'll, we'll try the mic. I'll try and stay near it. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, uh, also, um, it's interesting for me to hear about all the things that Tekka does. Um, we've been members for, for a while. Um, myself and some of our staff members, even though we're definitely not heating contractors, uh, have uh, taken advantage of some of your training courses. Um, I took your, uh, uh, I don't remember course here, Guy Lenzer. Principles of Moving Air. Sorry? Principles of Moving Air. Yes, taking that, but I was going to say even before that, the, the uh, quality first, I think it was called quality first, in terms of um, uh, sizing the forced air heating equipment and also oh, doing right. the ductwork design. Yeah. And, and the reason I did that is it was, uh, I wanted to be able to, uh, do my own calculations and uh, uh, design the layout of my forced air heating system for our house that we were renovating. Uh, we did that a decade ago in Surrey. And I, I've been ever since very fond of telling people that, you know, it's basically just that easy to take the course that you folks have available. Um, it's not really a lot of time or a lot of cost. Learn how to do it. And that means your heating contractor is putting in the right size of equipment and there's a much better chance of getting the right amount of heating or cooling to those rooms, all the things that I'm sure you know. And ever since, uh, I've been telling people, homeowners, builders, um, uh, uh, developers, etc., cetera, um, general contractors, like this is the type of thing you really gotta start looking for and asking and demanding of your heating contractor. Okay, so I'm actually very fond of saying that. Even today, um, anyone know Miracon, developer, big developer? I was talking to them in their boardroom this morning about step code and such, and we were talking about 
you know, how step code is going to involve heating contractors and energy advisors and lots of other people. And you know, it was actually very cool to hear them talk about their experiences um, relating to oversizing. Yeah, we're getting complaints about this and homeowners this and this and all these issues. And I'm like, okay, you know, this is, we're actually, if we don't be careful, we're on track to have more of those problems if we don't understand that step code is going to force us to make our buildings more energy efficient. And therefore, we as energy advisors need to understand that. HVAC contractors need to understand that. And, and, and also be able to take advantage of that to make sure the right size equipment is going in. Again, I am not a heating contractor. I don't even like play one on TV or anything like that. But we certainly do uh, have access to our software. We'll talk about it a little bit later. It does a block heat load calculation. And I would suggest a very accurate one because as energy advisors, our job is to understand all the intricate details about how this house is going to be built or was in fact built. Okay, when you, when you compare the numbers that this Hot 2000 software that we use uh, generates based on all these inputs relative to the size of the heating equipment in some houses, we're in some townhouses recently, which have a design heat load of approximately 15 to 18,000 BTUs yet they have a 60,000 BTU furnace. And I realize that there, there's, you know, there's some legitimate uh, reason and, and value to have slightly oversized equipment. You know, I think F280 uh, uh, allows, or I don't know, recommends allows, I guess, up to 40% oversizing or something like that. Um, but hey, not 300%, not 400%. So anyways, um, <clears throat> I say that mainly as a, I think, a very cool tie-in between the things we do as energy advisors, where things are going with step code, okay, uh, and also what you folks do here as heating contractors, okay. So, but we're learning as energy advisors, we need to get more on board with all the people that are involved with designing and building all the different parts of the house, and we'd like to sort of, you know, try and make sure that's uh, reciprocal. So I have the utmost uh, appreciation and respect for what you folks are doing here at Tekka and appreciate the invite to come down and talk to you tonight. Okay, so here's the subject. This is briefly we're going to look at. Uh, a few things that I would suggest are, are going to be top of mind for heating contractors, some of the sort of the takeaways of um, uh, what you'll, you'll want to know uh, in terms of your, uh, your involvement as a heating contractor with step code. Okay? How you tie in with air tightness, how you tie in with envelope efficiency, uh, right sizing, uh, and the fact that uh, you as an HVAC contractor actually do have a role, as do a lot of other sub-trades, in, uh, in uh, how good the air barrier system of a house or building ends up being, or not. Okay, <clears throat> has anyone been to a step code seminar? Has anyone been learning about step code? Or has it just kind of heard that word and like, I don't know, hopefully it goes away? And it doesn't bother us anymore. <laughs> not going to happen, sorry. Sorry? I shouldn't have called it. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, I am the same as everybody else, very adverse to change, but step code is here. It's actually, it has actually literally been in the code for almost a full year already. You know, we kind of, we kind of snuck, snuck it in there. Mm -hmm. Some municipalities, uh, it's actually very cool to see North Vancouver here, but district or city? Uh, it's way better than the city, right? Just yeah, welcome. Excellent. Good. <laughs> Don't tell me I said that. Uh, <clears throat> so um, you folks have had step code. Uh, trying to think. It's, do you remember when off the top of your when it came into effect? Start 2019. Oh, yeah. you guys haven't adopted it yet. Well, Maybe I think think of the July. city. July. Wasn't it? July is when when they started. It. Right, okay, yeah, yeah. So you're one of the early adopters, right? You're not waiting until 2020 when the mandatory um, uh, adoption happens. But anyways, um, <clears throat> we're starting to see certain municipalities uh, bring step code in, actually adopt and start using step code. Uh, and uh, as we'll see in a few slides, I think it's coming up uh, by the year 2020, by December 2020, we're expecting that every municipality in the province will have to adopt step code because that's what the new BC Energy Code will evolve to. Okay, so basically two years from today. BC Energy Step Code is all about performance compliance. Okay, has anybody um, uh, had a look at the building code recently in the last four years maybe? Section 9.36, energy, right? So that talks about efficiency of the equipment you guys put in. 
And if you kind of follow along with 9.36, a, a, a large part of how it's applied is just following the prescriptive uh, compliance option. So the builder just has to build a wall to this insulation value, put in this type of window. Uh, there's nothing in there about air tightness, there's efficiency of equipment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. BC Energy Step Code is going to get rid of all the prescriptive uh, requirements, prescriptive compliance items, and replace it with pure performance. Okay. How are we going to know if we're meeting step code levels? It's going to be a combination of energy modeling and a measurement of how airtight the house is. Okay, and that air tightness number gets put back into the energy model, which describes the performance of the house. This is all done by your energy advisor. And then the end result, the, the, the software will generate numbers that will compare against the step code targets. Okay, so what that means is that's, that's going to be the direct replacement for the prescriptive requirements. So that can be very daunting. Well, how am I going to know what to do? How, how am I going to build a house in two and a half years, in two years and one day when step code comes in. Well, you're gonna have to figure out your recipe, the way you'd like to build the house, is it gonna meet the step code targets? And if it doesn't, then you need to figure out with your energy advisor what you might have to upgrade to your favorite recipe in order to get it to meet the step code targets. Okay, that's basically what the, what the performance uh, metrics mean and the performance <coughs> path means. So the person putting it together, is your energy advisor. It was very late one night, I had fun with the options for animations in PowerPoint. Yeah, but it's still kind of fun, yeah. Okay, this is what step code looks like. Has anybody seen this? Yes, a couple people, some people, everybody? Okay, some people. So if you're not already familiar, now this is a little bit dated because we are about to expect an announcement which will take PTL off the, off the chart, and there'll be no more PTL. And also, if you're sharp-eyed, you recognize this is not for our local climate zone, uh, but I just didn't change the slide from when I used it last. So step code basically looks like this. You've got five different steps. And different municipalities will adopt different levels, tier uh, or level one, two, and three, of voluntarily up until December 2020, where it goes province-wide. And we're expecting that in 2020, the province will probably adopt step code level three across the board. So wherever you're building in the province uh, in December 2020, when the energy code uh, cycles, uh, we're expecting it'll probably be level three, step code level three that you'll have to build. That means every house will need energy modeling, blower fan testing, and you're gonna have to hit these numbers. What do these numbers mean? There is a standalone requirement that your house has to meet a certain air tightness requirement. It's got to be tested and it has to meet a certain air tightness value. So as soon as you get into step code level three, you have to meet an air tightness metric of 3.0 air changes per hour at 50 pascals, which is just the way we measure air tightness. And then it goes to two and a half, then to one and a half step code level four, finally 1.0 step code level five. Do you have any R2000 builders or people with experience with R2000 houses here? Okay, yeah, I should have known. <laughs> Very good. Um, so you recognize 1.5 air changes per hour is the air tightness metric that R2000 uh, builders have to achieve. That's a tight house. Anyone know anything about passive house? <coughs> How airtight does a passive house have to be? 0 0.6, right? So, you know, German, right? They want to be like, got to be better, right? So 0 0.6 air changes per hour. So it gives you an idea, we're, we're headed towards there eventually when we get to step code level five. Um, in case I don't see it in a, in a, a later slide, uh, timelines. So the province wants everyone to get to step code level five. Anyone know when? 2032. So it's not happening right away. Okay, we've got 14 years to get there. It is happening. We actually, we know, us as energy advisors, you as heating contractors, builders, developers, municipalities, um, suppliers, tradespeople, now this is your kind of warning shot over the bow. This is where the performance metrics are going in 2030, uh, uh, sorry, 2020, and then they're gonna get to 2030, get to these numbers by 2032. The nice thing is it's the same basic recipe, except the numbers uh, get lower. So you're tightening up, you're improving their performance over time in steps. So the industry, everyone involved in the industry has time to adopt and to grow. 
including us as energy advisors, and I would propose you guys as heating contractors. So air tightness is one aspect. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay. And again, as you step through the step code levels over the next roughly, well, 12 years, 12, 13 years, we're going to have to build tighter and tighter housing. <coughs> Guess what? You guys as HVAC contractors, you are one of the sub-trades that's putting stuff through the air barrier system. So now we're going to have to make sure, either you or the, the builder, make sure that those penetrations are in fact airtight. So we'll talk a bit more about that later in the, the presentation. Okay. So key points, the step code with that first column, air tightness. Air tightness is important. Air tightness is going to be measured. Right now, it's not measured. Uh, I had a, a, a building inspector in Squamish, I thought made a, a fantastic comment, and he says, we're going from a period where you passed your air barrier inspection through visual inspections, visual checking, we're going from that to a point in time, the step code, where you pass your air barrier inspection by having your air tightness measured. And there's a huge difference, okay? I know a lot about air barriers, or so I claim, so I think. Um, <clears throat> um, I can go through a building and say, yeah, like visually, these details check out, this looks very good. How airtight is it? I'll claim to have no idea until I can put my fan on the house and actually measure the air tightness. Because what I have learned is, Air tightness can hide behind ducting, behind pipes, behind framing, behind insulation. And you'd never know how airtight that building is until you actually measure it. Okay, so air tightness is important. It's going to be measured. Air tightness targets have to be met. So this column here tells us step code level two. One of the things the builders will have to achieve is a air tightness of 3.0 air changes per hour and the building tightens up as we move through these additional step code levels. Okay, and again, your tie-in, you say, well, hey, like, wait a minute, maybe this guy doesn't realize I'm the HVAC contractor. I'm not the, I'm not the air barrier guy, I'm not the insulator. I'm like, what's going on, right? But you guys are just one of the trades, one of many trades who are putting stuff through the envelope and the envelope includes the air barrier. Okay, the second category of step code metrics is a comparison of the uh, modeled performance of the house relative to this thing called the reference house performance. Uh, another way to look at that is this MEUI, we call this MEUI, M-E-U-I, it stands for Mechanical Energy Utilization Intensity. You can satisfy this category of step code requirements either way, and basically either way it addresses the efficiency of the envelope and the efficiency of your heating equipment, uh, your mechanical equipment, that's space heating, space cooling if you have it, domestic hot water heating, and ventilation. So all the stuff you guys deal with. Okay. So one of the keys here is cooling energy is included. Okay. So I would, I would like to expect, and I'm sure this will happen, that Builders, they'll certainly hear it from us, builders, developers, will be, be um, more aware, more conscientious of how much cooling energy might these houses need based on how they're built, the solar heat gain coefficient of the glazing, um, how much cooling energy is required based on the heat gain and how efficient your cooling equipment is. The more efficient your cooling equipment is, the easier it is for the builder developer to meet their percent better than or their MUI targets. The more efficient the heating equipment is, the easier they can meet their targets. The more efficient your uh, ventilation equipment is, the better your heat recovery. It's a way to upsell more efficient HRVs. Uh, anyone into drain water heat recovery? Is that more the plumbers? Maybe the more plumbers. Okay, you can, you can get into that, right? So the efficiency of your mechanic, all your mechanical equipment and the amount of cooling energy that buildings will require is going to factor into step code numbers. Okay, so there's another direct tie-in uh, to you folks. The uh, third uh, column or category, again, PTL is, is gonna go by the wayside in favor of just Teddy. Teddy is a metric of how good the envelope by itself retains the heat energy. Okay, it stands for thermal energy demand intensity. And you've got these numbers that get lower and lower over the years. 
So Teddy is strictly based on the envelope. Basie tells us the envelope is going to get better insulated, okay, as well as more airtight. Uh, what does that mean for the design heat load of the house? It's going down, way down. Okay, like this, Basie is going down by a factor of four over the next 12, 13 years. Okay, so. That's, that's basically good news and not scary if you know how to do heat load calculations because that's, that's basically telling us that's going to be more and more important. Okay? So, key points with this Teddy thing, insulation levels are going up. Now again, if you're not insulation contractors, why would you care? Well, you'd want to know about the insulation levels so you can account for that in your heat load calculations. Window performance is going up. Windows are going to have to have a higher insulation value window solar heat gain is going to become more important. Why? Because there's a benefit to capturing that solar heat energy, but if you capture too much at the wrong time of year, your super efficient envelope overheats, now you have a problem. Good thing you've got air conditioning, but remember cooling energy is now included. So if you have too much solar heat gain and your air conditioning works too much, it's going to count against your step code metrics. So it can be sort of too much of a good thing. Okay, so again, as we talked about that Teddy going down over the next uh, decade, uh, decade and a half, uh, this is an opportunity for you guys to, to basically um, have more demand and have more value in your heat load calculations. Okay, I am definitely someone who is telling anyone who is willing to listen, even maybe some who aren't, um, you gotta get property sized equipment in there. And basically, it's just to say, like, hey, developer, builder, general contractor, start looking for somebody who can say, yeah, you know, I'm a heating contractor and I do heat load calculation. Hey, you want to hire me because uh, I'm not the cheapest guy, but, you know, I know how to size stuff so I can provide you better value, including better value means fewer callbacks. Okay, let's segue into um, one of the main topics I wanted to bring to you uh, regarding um, I guess the crossover, the, the interaction between step code and heating contractors, and that has to do with that first column of metrics, the air, uh, air tightness metrics. Okay? And I want to uh, bring a few concepts to you that, that, quite frankly, hopefully you already know something about, maybe a lot about, and that's the idea of an air barrier and what it is and basically why you would care. So has anyone taken courses or done studies and building envelope, or maybe you've done the building science course through the Home Builder Association to kind of understand what an air barrier system is and does it have any relevance at all to what you folks do on a daily basis? Anyone, anyone know anything about air barriers? Okay, good, yeah, that's actually kind of good. Then I, I have something to talk about. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> building scientists uh, talk about different barrier systems. Can you? you you're in houses, I'm sure, all day long. Uh, you actually see a lot of these. Maybe you don't really know uh, much about what they are and how they work, but who's been in houses and never seen poly on the inside of a house before drywall? Everybody, right? Of course, right? So anyone know what that poly is doing? Anyone heard a builder or an insulator talk about, oh, that's the something? Vapor. Yeah, vapor barrier, right? Now, poly is actually also acting as the air barrier. Okay. Now, this, it's, this, this actually hints at how confusing all of this stuff is because we grow up in the industry, oh yeah, get, put up the poly vapor barrier, don't forget to overlap the vapor barrier, don't forget to use that black goopy stuff that gets all over the place, and you can't wash out. Make sure you tape up all the holes in the vapor barrier. But ironically, we do all that sealing work to make the poly airtight, not vapor tight. It's already vapor tight. The reason we overlap it, seal it, use the tape is to make it an airtight system. Now, we're not doing a very good job of it. Not you guys, but the people who are responsible for the poly. Because when we go out and test all these houses, especially locally, houses are not built very airtight. Okay. Now, you might think, well, maybe I don't want a very airtight house. Like, how will the children breathe? How will moisture get out of the house? How will I get fresh air? Well, you guys know you want a ventilation system. Okay, we as energy advisors know that we want a more airtight house to retain the heat energy, to allow the ventilation system to work better, 
right? Our energy modeling software, depending on how airtight we tell it the house is, if we say it's too leaky, it'll say, oh, none of your ventilation air is actually going through your HRV, it's just going through your envelope. It's just leaking through your envelope. So there's no value in having an HRV because no air goes here. Right? So we, we pop in this HRV into the model, and if we say the house is going to be leaky, then we don't get any value out of the HRV until we start snugging up the house. And that's a direct reflection of how things work in reality. So the house has to have an air barrier. It's required by code. Other barriers as well. And out in the field, when you're looking at the poly and all the tape and seams and overlaps and such that's used for it and, the, and the, the acoustic ceiling, you are looking at the air barrier. So it's an important part of the house. And anyone who puts something through the air barrier should be responsible for making sure that penetration remains airtight. Okay, so there's a whole list of people, starting with the framer. It's also the plumber. Excuse me, it's the electrician. It's the, uh, it's the HVAC contractor. It's the, um, the cable guy, right, with the big, long drill bit, Ooh, right, going through everything, right? Uh, all those sub-trades have a responsibility to basically not mess up the air barrier system. Not just the insulator who puts all the poly in. Okay, and I'll show you some examples later on to kind of uh, explain and, and reinforce that. So that's kind of going to be our new reality. So what's going to happen in the future? In my prediction, you heard it here first, or you can laugh later if it's wrong in five years. Uh, that's fine, that idiot said this and he was wrong. Uh, I'm quite convinced that builders who go through their first step code houses and have their energy advisors say, hey, like, everything checks out except, man, your house is nowhere near airtight enough. And you got your final inspection, like, well, like tomorrow or the day after, and, you know, people, the homeowners are coming to be moving in. But your house is not airtight enough. Now the builder's like, well, man, like, which trade do I blame? Like... Is, is it my HVAC contractor? Is it my plumber? Is it my framer? Is it my electrician? Is it my drywaller? Is it my cable guy? All of the above. Is it my insulator not doing a good job? And I mean, you really won't be able to point the finger at any particular person because there's too many people involved, right? So, so please recognize, and it's kind of my, my take home message that even though you may not think of it, you guys actually are one of those subtrades that has a positive or negative effect on the air barrier system. In my opinion, that is another big sales point. Okay, and I can tell you from this meeting with Miracon, and to give an idea of who they are, they are planning to build roughly 1,000 townhouses in Langley over the next eight to 10 years. Okay, so I was very interested and happy to talk to them about all the cool stuff that our company can do. And one of the things that uh, us, as potentially their energy advisor consultants, and, and helping them through step that we'll be talking about is saying, hey, Miracon, you want to align or ally, you want to work with subtrades who understand these things and don't just say, ah, step code, what a crock of whatever. Um, I don't need I don't need about air barriers because I'm not an air barrier guy. That's that's somebody else. I'm the HVAC guy or I'm the plumber, I'm the electrician, I'm not the air barrier guy. But the reality is those subtrades, and I would suggest you included, uh, really should uh, want and need to know about your impact on the air barrier so you can say, yeah, you know what, Mr. Mr. Developer is going to build a thousand townhouses and maybe I'd like to be a part of that. Um, hey, I know about the air barrier system and I know you have step code values to meet and you bet if you hire me, you know, I'm going to respect that and I'm not going to be the weak link in your air barrier system. Okay, so a few things an air barrier needs to be and needs to do. It has to be impermeable to airflow. Okay, that's why it's called an air barrier. Okay, so that means the materials that the usually the insulator uh, puts in, namely the poly, um, have to be impermeable to airflow. They also they all have to be connected, and this is where you guys come in, and the electrician, and the plumber, and the H, and the uh, sorry, the uh, the cable guy, etc. All those pieces of the air barrier system all have to connect together. When you run something through the air barrier system, that thing that goes through has to be sealed to the air barrier. So for you guys, that could be where the gas line comes in, where the where ducting goes out through the envelope, where your vent pipes go through the envelope. Uh, if you if you are running um, uh, HVAC ductwork up through an uninsulated attic, where well, you've got you know potentially have four <laughs> penetrations going up through the uh, up through the ceiling. Um, you want to be aware that you're going to be running your services through the air barrier system. So 
uh, eventually you'll probably be asking the builder, hey, so on this site, what are you using for the air barrier? That would be one of those like music to my ear things if I ever overheard an HVAC contract or any other subject, hey, Mr. Site Super, just so we know, so our guys know, what are you using for your air barrier system? Okay, I will literally tell our clients who are mainly, develop mainly developers, hey, if you ever hear this from an HVAC contractor, that's the person you want to hire because this guy is on board with what you have to achieve. So air barrier has to be continuous. All the different pieces have to connect in one to another. That means if you've got a vent pipe running through a rim joist area, and if the air barrier is already in place, then you need to figure out how that gets sealed. Now, we'll see how that works, whether you as the HVAC contractor become responsible for air sealing that, or maybe the site super will say, look, let me take care of that, you just do it in an intelligent way and do it here and here so I can have a better chance of air sealing up. Air barrier system has to be durable. So uh, you won't be putting in the bulk of the air barrier system, but your penetrations through the air barrier system have to be durable. So you'll want to think about the sealants or the tapes or the, the materials you use to render your penetrations through the air barrier airtight. Maybe there's a certain gasket. I am sure manufacturers will come up with products, maybe some type of a rubber-like sleeve that you can slide over vent pipes that has a bit of a flange that now it's easier for you or the insulator to tie that into the rest of the poly air barrier system. But there's, there's you know, if you're an inventor, take note. I'd like a little cut though, please. Just, you know, you've heard, heard, ever heard that, right? Ever heard, yeah, a great idea. A small percentage, I'm not greedy. Uh, there's opportunities for that to make everybody's life easier. Okay, so whatever you use to seal those penetrations, you got to think about, is this the right product? Is it going to last for 80 years, which is as, as long as the house uh, might or should last? Stiff and strong. The air barrier system, among other things, is there to prevent wind pressure and air pressure from moving air in and out of the house. So your penetrations and how you seal the penetrations have to respect that, have to be strong, stiff, durable. So that's where um, you, you want to have a structural support for your connections, right? You want to make sure, ideally, you've got some type of a rigid flange around your penetrations so that can be connected into the other parts of the air barrier system. One of the big challenges with the air barrier system is all those details. Holy cow, all those details. This is not a horrendously uh, complicated geometric design, but I don't know how many numbers are right, 25, maybe there's 27, 30, right? All these different details. Now, of course, not all of them, very few, relatively speaking, pertain to you guys, but what about something like this? Here's the venting for maybe a fireplace. This here might be the venting for the furnace. Right. There's at least a few of these. Somewhere here will be venting for a bathroom fan or a kitchen hood fan. So at least some of these are penetrations in the envelope, in the air barrier, that you folks as HVAC contractors are responsible for and are going to be responsible for in terms of how they go through the air barrier system. How do you know how good or how well your air barrier system is performing? How does the builder know? The builder's going to have their energy advisor come out and literally test, run a test to see how airtight the house is. Okay? And good builders are going to take advantage of this, have their energy advisor out during construction, while maybe you guys as HVAC contractors are also around and say, hey, let's, let's you know, while the fan is running and while air is getting sucked into the house, let's all go around and let's literally, literally feel and detect where the outside air is leaking in. And we can use smoke and we can use infrared cameras and fancier things, but you can use just the back of your hand and just feel over electrical boxes, feel around pipe or vent penetrations, feel around the things that you guys do, uh, and, and you'll know right away whether you feel air coming in or not, and you'll get an immediate, very tactile sense of how good an air seal you're able to create. And everybody's going to have to go through this, right? They're just going to have to realize and, and learn uh, from something like this how good or not their details are. Because okay? again, we're moving away from a time where this passes just by visually looking at, yeah, okay, yeah, the inspector or whoever looks at, yeah, good, you know, details look good. Uh, we're actually coming in and measuring uh, and any leakage that might be hidden behind uh, some of those details is going to get sucked through. 
Okay, the blower fan test, unfortunately, it's going to reveal all. You can have a bunch of hidden leakage. It's all going to show up in the measurement. That can be quite irritating sometimes, even for us, but that's what we have to deal with. Okay, the whole industry is going to have to learn more about what these air barriers are. And again, this is something the energy advisor can help with. Here they're taking the, uh, the construction crew through and just talking about some of the air barrier details. Okay, hey, this is a great detail. This, look at how good this works. There's no air coming through. Over here, eh, not so good. You know, you could improve this easily if you did this or this or this. Okay, there's different air barrier systems. Okay, we'll start to learn how more appreciation, hey, it's not just poly. There's nothing in the, you talked about the, I actually really like how you said it, you know, thou shalt, right? There's nothing in the code that says thou shalt use poly. It just says thou shalt have an air barrier and thine air barrier shall be continuous. So we all have to respect that. You could use something else as the air barrier system. For example, this is a house in New Westminster, actually not too far away. Um, you're looking at this pink stuff, which is the air barriers. Okay. Now, if you're working as an HVAC contractor or any sub-trade on this job, you would actually, you would, you, well, in my opinion, should be asking the builder, hey, what is your air barrier? Maybe, maybe you don't recognize that this is it, but hey, what's your air barrier? So if I run stuff through your air barrier, I know to either fix it or alert you so you can fix it. Okay. And again, any, any subcontractor that said that to this builder would be like, wow, like angelic voices singing from heaven. You know, what's your air barrier? Wow, really? Like, he'll probably hug you, maybe maybe pay you more money. I don't know, who knows, right? <laughs> maybe, I'm, maybe I'm going overboard. Here's another air barrier system. Okay, here is a house wrap. Uh, it's not in its finished state, but this is, uh, you're literally looking at the air barrier material for this particular house. So now you want to know, hey, uh, what about my penetrations going through this envelope, where those penetrations go through this Tyvek, that is where I have to make that airtight. Okay, uh, let's see if I got the right slide, here we go. Do you ever wonder what is your air barrier doing? Like what, like, what is its job? Its job is to again stop air moving even though there's pressure differences. So this is a picture of this side of the house, and again remember you're looking at the air barrier material here, this is with no air pressure, so our fan is off. And this is with the fan on, pressurizing the house. Now, maybe take a look up here. Look at the no pressure, pressure. No pressure, pressure. No pressure. I can do it all day. Uh, can you guys see the difference? Yeah, so like, man, that's what my air barrier has to do. So you can, you can I mean, it's just air, right? You can probably imagine any penetration, regardless of how small, air is going to leak out. That means um, heat energy is going to flow out of the house, so it's less efficient. And also there's moisture in that air, so now there's potential for condensation to happen in the envelope, both of which are bad. Okay. <clears throat> this is your air barrier in action. So what's happening here is we're pressurizing the house we filled the inside of the house with um, chemical smoke, theatrical smoke, um, and uh, it's kind of a fun day. And we're literally outside the house, just watching where the the air uh, is pouring out of the house. So you know, this is actually good. This is not a time to poke fun at people. This is to say, hey, now we all know where the leaks are. We've all learned a bit. Now we can take that information and, and go forward with it. You'll probably only need to go through this a few times or something like this, and you'll kind of say, okay, yeah, okay, now I get it. You know, I need to do this a bit better, figure out a different way to do this, maybe take course, learn how to do this. And then, you know, in six months or so down the road, once you get a hang of it, you'll know what your standard details are, and that'll just be the new way you, you run your penetrations. We talked about this already. Air bear is affected by almost everyone. So, right? so here's, here's a partial list. Okay. There is a bunch of stuff in the code already, which most people don't look at because it makes your eyes bleed, um, about prescriptive requirements for air barrier systems. Okay. Um, however, this is all stuff that's checked visually. So again, we're going away from this stuff, um, and the hope with these prescriptive requirements is that if you follow them and we visually check and see if they're followed, hopefully that will mean the building will be airtight. There's no direct connection between the two. So we're going away from that into a time where we're actually going to test the buildings. 
Let's take a look at a few uh, HVAC details and I'll offer my suggestions, my observations on what's happening and what could potentially uh, be done better. Uh, don't take this please to be a slag against you guys, especially you guys being here. Um, I do honestly have a lot of respect for what you guys do and, and you know, I'm a business owner too and you know, there's lots of things you have to think about and there's things I just don't realize. Um, so I appreciate when I get maybe a bit of information on it. And this is just a reflection on basically normal installation. Not bad, not particularly bad. It's just stuff that maybe we're not thinking about yet. It's just not on our radar. Here's the situation. You're in, you're in a garage, an attached garage. You're looking up at the ceiling out structure of the garage. And you've got a duct line running in between the, uh, the ceiling joists here. And this uh, plywood, this is the plywood subfloor. Above the plywood subfloor is a heated uh, space. It's a master bed. Okay. So it turns out that this plywood is also acting as the air barrier material, separating the air of the unheated garage from the air of the master bedroom above. Okay. And that means that this, this duct boot, close up of it, is actually a penetration. They cut a rectangular hole in the plywood subfloor and fill in with this duct boot. And in this case, that's basically how it's left. Now you can literally see through the holes into the light of the garage below, especially down here. Okay, so what do you think is gonna happen when this gets covered with a little bit of carpet? You know, a nice floor register gets put on. It's hidden from view, and then us annoying energy advisors come with our fan, depressurize the house. All that leakage is going to be included in the leakage we're measuring. And basically, we'd be lucky to find it. It's like, wow, where, where in this beautiful finished house is the leakage? Okay, if you do find it here, we're, we're sort of trained to look for this now. If you put your hand over that register, so the furnace is off, there's no air, from the furnace coming through the ductwork, you would probably be shocked to feel how much air is blasting out there. And honestly, if you're anything like me, until you do feel that, and you're like, we have like a holy shit moment, you know, um, you maybe don't, can't really grasp it. It becomes really tactile when you actually feel that, and you're like, wow, like, now, now I get it. You know, if I don't seal that up, that's gonna be a lot of leakage, okay? Right now, of course, this is happening in homes all over, uh, all over the, the area, uh, but it's not a big deal because those houses aren't yet getting tested for air tightness. But when they do start getting tested for air tightness, this is the type of thing that's gonna count against the air tightness of the house. Okay, this is the other duct boot in the same bedroom, so it's actually kind of worse, right? So. One of the ways we also measure uh, leakage is in, in the size of the hole. So you could literally say this is a hole that's almost an inch wide by, what is this, maybe six, seven inches deep, plus this part, you've got maybe uh, six, eight square inches of hole here. And that's the type of thing that our equipment picks up and it counts against the, the air tightness. Um, here is down in the basin, actually the same house. Um, probably know what's gonna happen, what's gonna be going through these four holes here there's gonna be four vent pipes. Now, the very smart thing that this HVAC contractor did is they spaced these holes apart. Now, maybe there's other reasons to do that. I don't know all the code stuff you guys have to comply with, but from an air barrier perspective, there's a big benefit to just spacing these apart so you can actually seal all the way around the perimeter of the penetration. And this applies to any vent pipes or ducts going through the air barrier system. And this is just one way they could seal that up. Another way they could have done it if they wanted to is they, the, um, the uh, HVAC contractor could have been responsible, if that's the contract, to seal the perimeter of the vent pipes into the wood, and then the insulator could have been responsible for sealing the wood into the poly air barrier system. Okay. Or maybe some builders say, hey, you know what? Um, tell me where you want to run your vent pipes and I'll, you know, I'll just kind of double check and make sure you put them in the good spot for me, and then you run them, and then let me take care of the rest. Not necessarily saying you're gonna be doing all this extra air sealing work, 
but now you're, you're part of the equation. You're built into the whole process. So there has to be a way to deal with penetrations like this. Okay, here's a, a vent pipe for a fireplace. Um, pretty nicely done. It follows the requirements in section 9.36 to have a, a sealant around there. They've even used a heat resistant sealant, even sealed that up. Uh, the tape here kind of looks like, I don't know, I'm not really, it's not lapping onto the metal, but it kind of looks like someone did something. How, does, does this look good? No, really? Why not? Oh, because the metal isn't taped to the wall. Right, yeah. Now, what, what if maybe there's some sealant behind? Like, Gary, you're so pessimistic. Oh, I put sealant behind. You just can't see it. <laughs> right? Sure you did. Yeah, okay. So this is an example where you don't know for sure, right? You don't know for sure visually looking at it, okay? You do a blower fan test on the house, turn your infrared camera on it, now you get to see the tracing of the cool air coming in, cooling down the surrounding area. So now you can see, oh yeah, well, you know, there's, this is cool just because of the conductive heat loss, but this is telltale air leakage signs, okay? So now you can go back and say, okay, well, yeah, there's some air sneaking out here, sneaking up somewhere here, probably, you know, we got a screw here, a screw here. Maybe there wasn't any sealant there, or maybe there wasn't enough structural support to squish that metal plate into the sealant, and there's also some leakage up there. You would never know that just looking at it. Okay, this is good because there's access around the pipes, like we talked about with the vent pipes. And also very good because the, the uh, I assume this is, I'm pretty sure this was the HVAC contractor, uh, he or she uh, nicely sealed the perimeter of the ducts into a, a rigid material, not just trying to seal it into the poly. Trying to seal uh, poly into the perimeter of these ducts is very challenging. It's a lot easier to, to seal those into, in this case, a, um, a thermal pan or uh, a plywood or, or blocks of wood, something solid, right? Um, air barriers can be many different materials. Nothing wrong with a thermopan, nothing wrong with a, a piece of plywood, uh, nothing wrong with uh, solid blocks of wood. Okay? Again, the, the key thing here is they space things apart. It's way easier to get a good seal. This visually looks extremely good on the front side. Uh, also with this, now what about the back side? I, I have no idea, like I'm not looking back, my head won't fit back there. But again, when I run the blower fan test, any leakage from behind that duct uh, is gonna, gonna show up in the results. Obviously it's not easy, maybe it's next to impossible to get back there and seal that. Okay, so question mark. Uh, <clears throat> leaving your house leaky is as easy as this. Visually, very good over here, a little bit questionable here, completely missed the tape over here. It's not to blame anyone, it's just to say, like, this is how it happens. Well, I, man, I'm, I was sure I went, but I was going to go back after lunch and just, you know, didn't. Um, is it a big deal? Well, it's going to become a big deal because we have to hit these air tightness targets. Okay, like, what are you supposed to do with this? Like, I don't know. Did you say leave? Right? It's challenging. I mean, there's no magical product that's going to allow you to easily air seal the perimeter of this flex duct to this flexible material. Okay? Now, if, if you're faced with a situation like this, hey, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with you talking to the builder and say, look, you know, down the basement, I, I want to run my ducting through in between these joists, and you know what? There's, I, I, I need something solid to run it through. So, you know, do you have a carpenter? Can he put some blocking there? Can he, can he um, cut a piece of rigid foam insulation with a nice round hole in the middle that I can feed my, my duct through? I'm not suggesting all of a sudden you will become these big air barrier contractor, but you can work with the, with the builder and say, look, you know, I, I respect what you're trying to achieve with the air barrier, and I don't want to, you know, create a new problem. If someone forgets to see, like, you can physically see how big a hole this is. Right? Now this, this is the easy side, what about the other side? Like, no one's going there, right? So if that happens, I mean, just, I, I spray foamed it, yeah, I mean, I mean, you did. Sorry? Well, the cores and the elbows aren't still. Yeah, well, yeah, that's another thing. Um, all the ductwork, by the way, any ductwork, the entire length of any ductwork that exits out of your, basically out of your air barrier, out of your heated space, 
that all becomes part of your air barrier system. When we depressurize the house, we depressurize the ductwork in the house, which is connected to the ductwork that goes outside the heated space. That means uh, it's going to draw air through any leaks in your ducts where they go through the attic or where they go through unconditioned space. Okay? What do we think of this? This is a retrofit. Poly. Yeah, good. Any poly here? Stuff with insulation, so we got your, your uh, thermal barrier back. Any idea how airtight fiberglass insulation is? Yeah, that's how you know how you are. Yeah, actually, you know how airtight it is because they basically use the same material for furnace buildings. Okay, um, Scott's talked about this, and um, there's actually some really cool tie-ins, so I'd like to talk briefly about them between what you guys do as HVAC contractors in terms of sizing equipment appropriately for the house and what we do as energy advisors. Now, we are not trying to be or replace you guys as heating contract. Your jobs are safe. You know, we're nerds. We don't, we don't even like to get our hands dirty. I got soft consultant hands. When I did the duct work in my house, it got all cut up. I mean, this is not a job for me. Yeah, it's blood everywhere, right? So it's not a job for me. So your job is very, very safe. And you probably don't want to be us stuck in an office all day. And, you know. uh, but anyways, the cool thing and where we, where we definitely agree is that we are going to be doing, through energy modeling, uh, kind of automatically in the background as a, as a result of our energy model, there's going to be heat load and cooling load calculations done. Now again, we're not trying to be you guys, we're not telling the heating con or the, sorry, the builder, hey, you know, use this number, but I definitely tell my clients, hey, as a byproduct of what we do, we're modeling the house, including all this information. Guess what? The same type of stuff you guys account for when you do your F280 calculations. Our software is calculating a heating load, cooling load calculation. And you know what, Mr. Builder, Mr. Developer, if you want, you could take a look at how our number compares to what your heating contractor is suggesting. Now, who's right? Not necessarily suggesting that we're the right ones, but you know what? Our number should be somewhere in the neighborhood of the same number, right? Maybe, maybe 20, 30, 50% different, but 200% different? That mm, might be suspicious. 300% different? That could be suspicious, okay? Um, so I tell our, our clients, and this is something you guys could be aware of, and also leverage, you can say, hey, Mr. Builder, um, you're doing this house through step code. You know, hey, can I get the calculation? Can I get the number that your energy advisor came up with? Or, can I get the, and or, can I get the step code paperwork, which basically explains, lists the recipe. This house is going to be built this way to meet this step code target. That could actually be super useful, because now you have a record of, well, hey, I, I did my heat load calculations, and my room, my room calcs, based on these construction specs, this is from your step code paperwork. Like, there's nothing better you could use. Actually, maybe good to, like, protect yourself. Oh, it's the wrong calculation. Why is well that's updated? Well, you didn't give me the updated one, so go see someone else. Okay, here's a little example of, of where it could go. So this is again that house in US Minster. It's a small house. Okay, it's a full, uh, almost fully below grade basement, uh, main level, then a sort of half story upstairs. Um, <clears throat> it's in US Minster. It's built uh, quite energy efficient. Uh, has an air change rate of roughly 1.0 per hour. Any guesses what the design heat load might be for this house? 12,000. Look at my slides beforehand. Mm -hmm. Probably pretty low, right? Small house, local climate. I understand something about pretty energy efficient, low air change rate. Yeah, like this is not going to have a huge heat load. Of course, you you only would would uh, figure that out by calculating it, and that's a byproduct of what we're doing with our energy model. So here's the energy model for this particular house. And one of the things that pops up is a design heat loss. In this case, 2.4 kilowatts. So how many how many BTUs is that? Uh, a little bit less, yeah, but right in that ballpark. So so um, what what should you heat this with? Furnace? We're gonna get a 9,000 BTU furnace. Turn your lights, yeah, yeah. Hair two, two hair dryers will do it. Absolutely, two hair dryers will do it, right? And one of the ways that builders and, and sub-trades start to get a bit of an idea of how well a house like this performs is during the construction process, where there's the equivalent of a hair dryer, 
i.e. this electric uh, uh, utility heater, in the basement heating the house. This house, I was there a year or two ago, it was minus four overnight, nice and comfortable inside, halfway through construction, based on their air tightness and their exterior insulation, and they were heating it with, uh, I think, a 2,500 watt uh, electric like construction heater in the basement. And everyone's like, yeah, this is great, this is awesome. Like, that's, that's an energy efficient house in action. Okay, how should we heat this house? Again, it leads to discussions, like what, what should, should we use a furnace? A boiler, yeah, you gotta use a boiler, like that's like super energy efficient, in floor radiant heat, as long as you can get a 9,000 BTU boiler. Right, that's kind of a joke. Air dryer, we need to split heat pump. You know, maybe you'll wind your way to electric baseboards. Ooh, electric baseboards, yeah, ugly, Ugh, right? What would you expect to pay to heat this house if you used electric baseboards to heat this house? Not much. Your annual heating cost would be about 150 bucks. Who cares if their annual heating cost is 150 bucks? Is there a cooling load on that house? Uh, yes, not a lot because of um, the heat, the, not the, heat, the uh, builder paying attention to the solar heat gain coefficient of the windows. But that's a very good question, David, because one of the byproducts of having a very good envelope is it keeps the heat in whether you want it to keep the heat in or not. So if there's too much solar heat gain, or if you're having a party, or you're baking a pie, and extra heat energy gives into the house, now it's gonna remain more trapped in a more energy efficient house. Something to think about. So the recipe, us as energy advisors, becoming very, very conscious about the recipe. What are you gonna mix and match? What's the, the, the appropriate uh, group of um, um, uh, construction elements to come together to meet the step code requirements? And this is stuff I would suggest HVAC contractors will want to also know about so you can decide, help the builder decide the right type of equipment and the right size of equipment. Okay, including things like this here. This is on the, the front fence. It's a little note to everyone entering the site. Hey, this is an airtight building. Talk to, here you go, report all penetrations to supervisor. Okay, we're gonna have a new person on site, a new designation called the air boss. So let me know what help you. So the air boss has his job, hey, like I gotta meet this step code air tightness target. Uh, I gotta talk to, have a little debrief with everyone coming on the site and make sure I know where their penetrations are going. Okay, we actually kind of just covered this, David, with your comments. So one of the byproducts of a more efficient house, it keeps all the heat in, whether it's, it's uh, advantageous or not. Okay, this is actually the same house. It actually has a higher design cooling load than a design heating load. Okay. Now, maybe it's not using more energy for cooling over the year, but basically it's saying it actually needs a bigger cooling system than a heating system. Okay. You guys know all about that. This stuff is gonna become more important. Okay. As we make buildings more efficient, there's gonna be more risk of overheating. There's going to be a guarantee, you, know, you heard it here first, uh, guaranteed to be more need for air conditioning. Even though we're in a you know, mild climate, there's gonna be more need for air conditioning. Maybe not a huge amount of air conditioning in a house, but more need for air conditioning to, to uh, draw the temperature back. Okay, so that's basically it. That's what we take, took a look at, step code and air tightness, and why you guys as HVAC contractors care about that. Envelope efficiency, how that ties into you guys as HVAC contractors. This one here is in Marriage of Made in Heaven. Uh, you guys know about right side, especially you guys and taking your course. Uh, that's gonna be a more important thing uh, regarding step code as well. Okay, so in summary, that's the HVAC contractor's role, uh, as I see it, uh, in the air barrier system and step code. And again, uh, certainly myself, as an energy advisor, I am talking to my clients saying, this is the type of thing you want to look for knowledge about in your subtrades. So hopefully this has been helpful. You guys can talk a bit more language. Like, how good would it be for you guys to talk to the same developers I'm talking to? Mircom might be one. And, and they get to hear the same language. Hey, my energy guys, advisor guy said, you know, right sizing and house is a system, and so did my HVAC contract. Yeah. Smart. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Are you coming back afterwards and doing the uh, lower door test of the house's 
Wait, yes. Your yeah. Drywall and your paint is your barrier. Yes. Yeah. Actually, very good point. Yeah, I did not mention that, but you're absolutely right. So that mid-construction test is just for the the benefit of the builder and maybe his subtrades to say, are we on track? Our air barrier system is in place, but it's still visible. Let's test it now. See how everything's going. Everything's good. Great. Let's board it up, and then we will come back and do a test when the house is fully complete. And that will be the one that counts. And one more quick question regarding what David mentioned: the air conditioning. Um, so that. To cut down on your uh, air conditioning necessary for the house, it could also be incorporated in the design of the house and the overhang and the windows. And absolutely, well. absolutely, absolutely. The house where there's hardly any air conditioning or no heat. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that's something. Again, I, I honestly believe. Uh, I'm convinced. I mean, that's what our business is based on. The more you can talk to builders about that and, and also ask questions, hey, like, you know, I, I'm the heat, I'm the HVAC guy, I'm the heat loss expert and cooling expert. I did an evaluation of your design, and man, like, you know, you're gonna have an overheating issue. Right? So I'm telling I'm telling you you as the HVAC contractor telling the developer, you know what, like I, I you know, you might want to look at cooling, or maybe you really need to look at cooling. Like I that let me put it in because you're gonna have a problem here or figure out a way through your design or your window spec or something else to minimize that uh, that heat energy and that requirement for the cooling load. Yep. What is the status of our um, uh, duct penetrations of the envelope when you do the air barrier test? Are they sealed up? Are they assumed to be sealed when you do the air barrier test or are they invisible? Yeah, so, uh, oh, so the, the actual vents? Yeah, actually a very good question. and. I haven't heard a solid answer on that. So when we do enter guide testing, we're supposed to leave them open and test in the as operated condition. Step code doesn't give us any firm direction on that. So I would I would tend to think that step code is thinking about leakage through the envelope, right? So I would tend to think we should be okay to close off um, makeup air lines, um, any any undamper ventilation lines, that sort of. That's my opinion right now. However, if that changes and the ruling comes down, no, you got to test it as operated. That means any combustion air vent, any any undampered uh, uh, penetration that remains a hole, and that will be included in the air leakage valve. Good question. Great question. Yeah, Danny. I'm not from here, so maybe it's a bad question. But what about the big building, like the condo that's popping up out everywhere? Yep. Um, does the code go to the condo too, or it's only for the house? It's for everything. Part nine. three buildings as well as part nine buildings. So including yep. huge ones. Yeah. Yeah. So so even like condo buildings will go through the same thing. Energy modeling. I mean, obviously, no longer an energy advisor because different scope, but an energy modeler, <coughs> um, <coughs> professional sign-offs, and once the building is built, literally a blower fan test on that whole building. We're, we're very excited about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Catherine, for the invite. I appreciate talking to you guys. Uh, if you have any need or interest in talking to me in the future, uh, you can get a hold of me through Catherine or Scott or, or David. Um, if you have questions that maybe I can help you with from the energy advisor perspective, uh, please get in touch with me. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Heiner. <laughs>
but we also have to distribute that. So to understand that room by room heat load, that's why we have to do our own, basically, heat loss calculation. I do think it's great, though, energy advisors in the background doing these already, and let's say their heat losses, they come out with 80,000, that's what the structure is going to use. Our room by room heat loss, maybe it's 75, maybe it's 85, but at least we know we're in the right ballpark. So I think, uh, I think that's a, a, good, a good marriage there. David. A quick comment. If you believe in right sizing, and I think that's where the world's going, it also means that you don't have a slush fund of twice the capacity. So you've got to have damn good distribution, or you're going to end up cold rooms and warm rooms. So that distribution, the allocation of this, becomes much more important than it was when we put 100,000 BTU into a 50,000 BTU load and had lots of give. Exactly. Actually, can I make another comment? Absolutely. Uh, Scott, you mentioned earlier about um, commissioning. So commissioning is definitely something that's um, being talked more and more about. So um, <clears throat> commissioning of ventilation systems, that very likely will lead into commissioning of uh, heating, maybe cooling systems. Um, so City of Vancouver is implementing that. Uh, it's actually really interesting to hear about um, the uh, district of North End, right, you're saying? Yeah. That has a requirement for commissioning. And uh, that makes really perfect sense because if we're trying to make buildings perform better, well, how is anybody, how are municipalities, governments going to know we're actually meeting those targets? A lot of it has to do with making sure the right equipment is there and it's working properly. And don't even get me started on educating homeowners to operate that equipment properly. It's interesting. So, so as our air changes reduce, we're at 2.5. Next thing you know, we're at one air change per hour. So, I don't know. What do we do, Liner? Do we build these ISO block walls, tiny little window like this, like the Reman Center, and you know, jump in a plastic bag? And okay, we're airtight. We're easing very. So, so every day we're getting. The whole point is to become more energy efficient with respect to infiltration. So this is where the HRVs come into play. Somehow you have to manage that air change process, process and you have to do it efficiently. So eventually the, the bath fans and, and so forth and just bringing in unheated uh, makeup air is not going to fly. So this is where the uh, HRVs are coming into play. It's going to be a significant part moving forward, uh, which is why we now have the training in it. Okay, so uh, I'd like to thank Andrew, uh, Andrew Dyke for setting up the display. Make sure you have a look at his stuff if you don't mind. Uh, he is our treasurer, controls the budget, so let's keep him happy. Uh, other than that, thank you very much for coming out tonight. And uh, to all, I guess, a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thanks,